What is up, Thrive Fam? CJ Finley here again with another episode of the Thrive in Life podcast. And tonight I'm here with my wife, Erin Finley, and we're going to get right into this discussion around postpartum. She gave birth to our son a little over three and a half months ago, and now she's had some thoughts and feelings based on reflecting on how those three months have been. So we're going to go to the first question, which is walk us through what was going through your mind immediately after giving birth? Immediately after giving birth, uh, I think it's kind of a whirlwind. And looking back now, it just all feels kind of like a blur. You're so infatuated and kind of in this state of bliss with the new baby. And I think at the same time, you're realizing that the baby's no longer inside you anymore and you're trying to recover yourself. And I think that was a little difficult for me to grasp that like we have this, our son is in the world and I can't really walk or move around. (laughs) Granted, I had a, I had a smooth birth and everything went well, but I think that that first couple of days you underestimate how taxing it really can be on the body, especially if you do receive pain medication and that starts to wear off. You're like, Whoa, okay. We just went through something. So I think that's that was a lot of the feeling. And then I guess breastfeeding and trying all that and getting used to that was a whole experience in itself also. And then you and I just figuring out how to be awake for <laughs> 24 hours a day. What was your mind like, though? Like, give us give us insight into what Aaron's mind was feeling in those moments. So you're describing that you're coming down from pain medication wearing off because you're getting that in in the hospital and then we're coming home. What physically, clearly you were in pain, but mentally, how were you going through that? Yeah, I think, so I described the physical side of things mentally you prepare, or at least I prepared for the fact that my hormones would significantly be altered immediately after birth, or at least those couple days after. And what I had heard um, through the, some of the classes I took was the first day you're in all, you're just in la la land because your baby's here. The second day you get moved, well, you're still in the hospital, but you're not just having given birth. You've had some time to sleep maybe for however long. (laughs) And you're just there with your, your partner trying to figure things out and you're still kind of distracted. When you go home, it hits you. You're not pregnant anymore. Your baby's here. All the focus goes on the baby. And I think that that's something that can be challenging in that you're still having to do so much recovering and be the mom that your baby needs you to be and I'd say it it was more physical for me than mental I, I truly feel grateful that I didn't have a negative mental experience around that I think the only thing that I struggled with a little bit was not being able to do more. Like I'm very self-sufficient as a person and I felt like helpless that I couldn't be doing more around the house at that time. And I don't know, maybe second time around I'll be different. I just wanted to be really cautious and not overdo anything because I hadn't gone through this before. And so was erring on the side of more rest and taking things easier. And I think mentally that might've played a role too, just helping me slow down and relax. Um, but the focus definitely does divert to your baby. And I think it is important for people to check in on, on how the mom's doing. And fortunately I, ha- I had family, uh, do that for us. And I think that that helped a lot. Yeah. From what I witnessed, the struggle really is your doing your best to take care of this new being, but you're also trying to take care of yourself. And it's not really something that somebody can necessarily do for you because 
I can help around the house and I can do certain things for the baby, but I couldn't breastfeed him. Yeah. And, and then you're also in pain. Like I can't, I can't fix that pain for you. And certain things that you're going through physically, you just have to go through them. Like I, I can't really do anything remember, other than like, yeah, this just popped into you. my head and I'm glad I remembered it. A real feeling I had in those first few days was like, you know, you want to just like take a shower and feel like put together and you feel guilty for that. And like, it's just like a couple well, minutes. What do you mean by put together? Like, you just want to feel like refreshed. Like I wanted to like wash my hair, wash my face, like put on some different clothes. You just kind of feel <laughs> like you need that time to rejuvenate yourself. And I think it's normal to feel what I felt, which was like, oh, but I can't, it's hard. It was hard for me to spend that time on myself, but I made a point to be like, this is important for the care of the baby. So the guilt is real. And then that, that guilt, I think, carries on a little bit. As the days go by and the weeks go by, I knew this would be something that I would struggle with a little bit because I knew self-care and prioritizing time for myself was something I definitely wanted to do. But it can be tough to to take that time. Were you expecting that or unexpecting that? I was expecting that. What were some things that you weren't expecting? I think something I wasn't expecting was going back to the physical, how long it took for me to actually feel good walking again. And like the amount of things I had to prepare in postpartum for myself. Like I was so focused on like everything that we needed to have ready for baby in his nursery, in our bedroom, the breastfeeding stuff, all the things that you need as newborn essentials in that first period of time. But I didn't like do that much preparation for like diapers for myself. <laughs> and <laughs> so now all we're getting that. Into the juicy stuff. I wanted, I want you, I wanted, fi- let's flash back five minutes. Like that's the stuff I want you to tell people. It's like I didn't want to be the guy that like was saying that. Yeah, I like, mean, what were you really going through? I was what, like, what I, is the mom? Really I was go not through? expecting to be like bleeding still. I mean, I That's guess just, it, like, there's just not bleeding. there's there's just not that much. I don't know what the word like. You mean you, people don't talk about this? Yeah, people don't talk about it. Even when <laughs> you take like newborn this. classes, it's not like oh, by the way, mother, like don't forget you're gonna be wearing diapers too, and <laughs> you're gonna still be bleeding, and you're you're still so gonna have lo- a belly. <laughs> how long did you wear diapers for? <laughs> oh, longer than I wanted to, probably like a couple weeks. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean that wasn't that wasn't. Yeah, but fun. this is the shit that we need to be talking about. Yeah. Um, what else? Yeah. So there's just like, obviously this depends on what kind of birth you had, but if you have a natural birth, vaginal birth, um, be prepared to wear diapers and have okay, all the postpartum the supplies. Nitty-gritty. Like, did it hurt when you peed the first time? Um, actually that's a good, let's take it back. That was in the hospital. And one of the things they told me when we, we transferred to the mother baby unit was, you know, we're, they're rolling our baby in, they're getting us set up in the room. And the nurse, the night nurse is like, by the way, you have to pee before 10 PM. And in my head, I'm just like, fuck, <laughs> like, that's the last thing I want to do right now. I can barely walk. And all I can think about is like how uncomfortable that is going to be. Um, and because you just feel a lot of pressure in your pelvic floor area and there's just blood going on down there. It's just not a, not a nice situation. And I remember she came in another time and was like, did you pee yet? And I'm like, no, like I don't really have to. <laughs> and cause that's the other thing. Like you're so like pumped up on these IVs and it's going out that way for a while that you're just not thinking about peeing for all that time. And so I was very nervous about it and I couldn't. And so at one point she was there in the room and she was like, why don't you just try right here? And so I was trying and I couldn't. And then finally, like a couple hours later, I was able to, but that was, yeah, that was a very unexpected. It goes into the unexpected of like, so you also have to go number two. And then for the baby, they have to pee and poop 
Oh yeah, that was stressful because we were like every time they'd come in, they were like, "Did he have a, a wet diaper?" Blah blah blah. And you, we're definitely like trying to track all that. But when he wasn't having, I think there was one point where he didn't have a, a wet diaper. And they're like, if he goes home and he still doesn't have a wet diaper, you need to call the hospital. So that was a little nerve wracking. But you were you were calm, cool, and collected. And you're like, it's gonna be fine. He's he will have a wet diaper, <laughs> and he did eventually. Yeah, I mean, I'm the type of person like there's no there's no use to worry until it's time to worry. Like I just yeah, don't yeah. live in that mindset. It's like it's all gonna be good. We're in a and we're in a place where if they need to do testing or things like that, he's right here. So I was very confident in we were going to be out on time. My thing was it, I wish I could take some of the suffering away. Yeah. Like it's hard to sit there but I as will the say, man and, and not be able to take on some of the suffering. I will say though, cause I don't want anyone who's expecting or is planning to have kids in the future the suffering is so temporary and it's all with the greatest joy at the same time. So looking back, like it's not the hardest thing I've been through. Yeah, but I, I, I agree watching you. I don't even think it's the hardest thing I've seen you go through, like in our relationship together, but I also don't want to downplay like, I mean, you were freaking out about the blood. We had to like go to an extra appointment because of that extra suffering. And in my mind, it was tough for me because I'm like, you're fine. Like, I'm trying to like calm you down and be like, everything's going to be fine. But the reality is, well, the, rea the reality is I'm thinking, I wish part of this could be me. The reality is, and this is something that is important to say, when you have, when you give birth, you don't see your doctor again for six weeks. So you're going through this recovery period without a check-in you actually check in with the pediatrician before you check in with your own doctor. And at the pediatrician appointment, they ask you a few questions about how you're doing recovery wise, but you go all this time seeing your doctor every month and then on a weekly basis and then not again for six weeks when you're actually probably wanting to speak to someone the most. And that was why it was scary. And we did go back. I think it was one or two times uh, before the six weeks because there were things that I was concerned about. And I I don't regret doing that because I was like, you know, I just want to make sure everything is okay and I'd rather err on the side of caution if the worst case is that they tell me, you're all good, go home, then that's the best case too. Um, so I didn't want to sit at home and just be freaking out while I'm trying to care for my baby and then wondering if something's wrong with me. Um, yeah, so two things. One was around the bleeding, and then the other one was I discovered uh, a lump in my breast, and it wasn't a clogged duck. So <laughs> that's a story for another day, but those two things were real things that I had to experience at the same time trying to, you know, navigate motherhood. You mentioned pelvic floor. I think this is another thing that one most people don't even think about on a daily basis. I don't know why that would come up before you're pregnant. <laughs> but then two, for me watching, I've, watching you, I feel like there's so much contradictory information out there that it's a struggle to navigate what to actually do. So like what kind of contradictory information do you, you mean like, like around exercise? Yeah. What exercises to do, what exercises not to do, how often should you work out? When should you start working out? And it's funny because I had to remind Aaron, like I would show you Olympic athletes, women, and when they would return the sport, because when Aaron would go to a PT or she would go to different doctors, they're treating her like the av average everyday person. And I would have to remind her, like, you're not the average everyday person. Like you've trained for this almost your entire life for the past decade. You've trained to give birth pretty much because you train at a level that you're just really fit and you're ready for this. So when you're talking about recovery, you doing nothing is like the worst thing for your body because not only is your body not used to doing nothing, but your body is primed to do it a different way than most people are doing it. And you weren't seeing people that understood that. And that was, that was a frustrating thing for me. 
But for you, how are you going through it? And what were you doing to research and find information that aligned with your views on? Again, I was erring on the side of caution because I hadn't gone through this before. I didn't know how I would respond. I didn't want to do more harm. But what does caution look like? Caution for me was like literally resting and just walking. And as much as my mind felt ready to get back to exercise, I knew that my body had been through something traumatic. Okay, but a metric to this. How long did you rest and what does rest look like? You were talking about, okay, I was walking, but when was your first workout? I think I started walking like a couple days after birth. And then I was walking like 30 minutes a day from like a week after a week post birth up until like six weeks postpartum. And then now you were working out. I start, if you would consider it working out. So I'll go <laughs> Again, through what it was. To, the point, to my point, like you didn't consider it working out, but it's a workout to I the everyday person. So I started core rehabbing and <laughs> <laughs> Oh, workout. In, in my in my <laughs> dictionary, it's not really a workout. A workout would be like something strenuous in my head. But yes, you're right. I have to be careful with my choice of words. I was doing core rehab probably starting at one week. I don't, I don't care about you being careful with your choice of words. I want you to reflect on how much of a savage you are and like align with that. No, I think I could have like I think if the next time around, I'm gonna probably get it back into things a little sooner than I had, it, assuming all goes well. But I really didn't want to do anything that would cause... Yeah, it's your first time through pregnancy, so you were you were just taking notes. Yeah, I was really trying to give myself as much rest as possible. Did not want to, like I said, have to revert and cause injury or any other kind of problems that would lead to difficulties down the line when that's unnecessary. So I was like, let me take this time, just do walking, and that was nice. That was what I needed. Um as much as I was like ready to get back into some other form of movement, I, I didn't. And I just focused on core rehab. And that looked like, it's hard to explain with words, but a lot of just like breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, holding like a Pilates ball, pressing in and using my breath to like contract uh, doing like variations of like modified side planks on the ground to just try to rehab and bring my abdominal muscles back together because um, there's a lot of separation that happens during the pregnancy and I did have I still do and still am healing from some diastasis so and for those that don't know that's when everyone goes through it to some degree but it's when your abdominal muscles separate so the linea alba down the middle of your abdominals creates basically a separation between your abs. And that is something that you have to repair and work to repair over time postpartum. And you, there's things that you can do during pregnancy to minimize how bad it occurs. Um, but for me, I, I, it was pretty, pretty severe. I had like a three finger separation, three and a half finger separation. So that's something that I'm working to heal. And so I started those exercises pretty shortly after birth and was doing them once a day, every day, and then still doing some deep core type of work to this day. And I'm now 14 weeks postpartum. When did you start running again? I started running again at like the six week mark. I did see a pelvic floor physical therapist and the reason why I went there, I wasn't really having any symptoms where I felt like I needed to go to physical therapy, but because it was my first time, I wanted to just get guidance on how to safely return to the level of fitness that I was at before. I knew it was going to take time, but wanted their guidance on how to return to running and just making sure I was in the clear before I started getting back into things at a higher intensity. And the guidance I received was you can start running when lifting weights feels good, you don't have any symptoms, when unilateral work feels good, so like doing like one-legged exercises or anything that uses like one plane of your body, and then when jumping feels good. And when I say feels good, what, what I mean is you're not having any symptoms, so you're not feeling heaviness, pain, any leaking, 
any bleeding that starts up after that. And I was good the whole time. I felt like I was ready to progress. So I started running. We were at the shore at that time. And that run I did with you, I think we did like two miles. And what was our pace? It wasn't that slow. I think it was like eight and a half. I think I was just so happy <laughs> to be running again. Because for me, that I stopped running in my like at the start of the third trimester. So it was, what, like six months almost. It felt like. Wow, I didn't even realize that. So six months total, you didn't run at all? Maybe that's an exaggeration. So probably like from December to. June. Yeah, six months, right? Yeah. I think that's something that you can potentially play with doing sooner next yeah. time. Especially because, like, if you run a 10 or 11 minute mile, like, you can still kind of have a little bit of a, a jog going. Um, I think you could also run a little bit longer next time, especially on the treadmill. I did start to feel like the first couple runs back, and I took it slow. Like, I was only doing like a two, mi two mile spurt at a time at a pace that's less than what I would normally want to do. And I did feel a little bit of heaviness after the fact. So, that was like my signal to not do too much too soon. Um, but now I'm back to normal. I'm still pushing the pace. Like I'm not, I'm not where I was and it'll take me a while to get there, but I don't feel any kind of discomfort now. Actually, I feel very good and it's a hundred degrees out. So I'm ready for like the winter where I can feel like my, my pace actually reflects how good I feel. What does that pace look like for context for those that are listening? What was your pace before pregnancy? I, I'm not like a showy numbers person, but and it's all relative. So like for me. Yes, but it's important for people to hear this. For me, like I, I was prior to getting pregnant, I was training for a sub hour and a half half marathon. Um, and so. That obviously got pushed to the side once I knew I was pregnant and wasn't going to be running at the, that level, um, but would like to get back there in the next couple of months to training hard like that. So that's like seven minute miles. Awesome. Last couple questions revolving around this topic. We haven't talked about nutrition at all. What was your nutrition during pregnancy and then how did that change? after you gave birth? It didn't really change. I think my focus after birth was just making sure that I was getting enough nutrients in my meals. I was definitely breastfeeding. If you're going to breastfeed, you'll be hungry. So my appetite was like pretty strong um, and felt like I needed to keep eating. And I would wake up sometimes in the middle of the night like super hungry. What do you get your nutrients from? food <laughs> no like, we, I we gotta do more podcasts with you no. oh like food that's super valuable to the person on the no, other no I mean the way like, you, asked that, the way you asked that question no shit you could have said like what <laughs> foods do you eat I don't no, know where do you get your nutrients from what do you consider nutrient dense foods is that a better question yeah like okay lean <laughs> meats fish uh, vegetables grass fed beef yep I've been on a grass-fed beef kick. We just had it for dinner, and I told CJ I could eat it every day. And he was, was very surprised by that because there was a period of, of time not too long ago where I, like, did not eat any kind of beef at all. And I think it was just, like, a mental thing. But now I just feel really good when, when I eat beef. And I actually really like the taste of it, too. Because I used to just really be like, good plant. like we don't we don't really do much to it. If you get quality beef, and just use some salt and some pepper, it's like, it's great. You don't need anything else. Yeah. So eating more of that. We do ground turkey too, but now that I've had the beef, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed less less turkey coming in. Like today, for example, when you were just like, oh, I'm gonna cook the ground beef for dinner. I'm like, yeah, I converted her. <laughs> it's, it's good so that, that's where I get my nutrients from I make smoothies what else eggs a lot of eggs 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's important for people to hear this one because like I think especially women look at and you did this in the past like fat doesn't equal fat like fat in your food those calories yeah, doesn't actually, equal fat. If you're breastfeeding, like one of the most important macronutrients you you need to have is fat. So I was actually increasing the amount of fat I was taking in, putting like ghee butter on eggs and things like that, um, adding nuts and seeds, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds. What's your guilty pleasure? Um, probably the cookies. <laughs> I ate a lot of cookies in no, those first couple weeks me. postpartum. No, I did. Remember, we people, what our neighbors we, kept bringing us cookies, and like I ate the whole. Yeah, but I see you package. control yourself with those. Like, no, you literally eat chips every day. Like we were in Whole Foods the other day, and she's like, "I got, I got like one more thing. I got to go like find." And I wasn't gonna follow her, and then I'm like. She's walking to the back of the store. Let me go find where she's going. And you now you have these. It's either crackers they're not or chips. chips. They're, crackers. they're like cracker chips. <laughs> Whatever. They're a hybrid. That is your. That I would say that's your guilty pleasure. Why does it have to be guilty? What's wrong with a cracker? I don't consider it guilty. We can eat whatever we want whenever we want because that's how we kind of go about life. Yeah. Like within reason, obviously, we don't eat highly processed foods and things like that. But I meant more so like guilty pleasure is in what's not your staple food stable food is the, the the proteins the healthy fats what are some of the things that we wouldn't if we were in a desert we wouldn't be searching for because we wouldn't survive off of them but they're just really good and we like to eat them cookies is one of them but you also have been doing this i will say you've been baking a lot not i don't know what to call it it's like non-baking baking kind of <laughs> like what what is that thing that you just <laughs> made earlier today i've been finding good recipes on like social media they're like, it's like kind of like a cookie dough, but you don't bake it. And it has like peanut butter in it, almond flour, maple syrup. And what do you put with jars? Protein powder. Because those are kind of cool too. The jars? It's just yeah, a like, jar. It, they don't have, they're not like a special jar. No. No. They kind of look special. Anything else that you want to cover postpartum, three and a half months in? Let's see. Tick tock goes the <laughs> clock. I guess uh, one of the things that would be interesting to cover is how this is tomorrow is my the start of my third week back to work full time. And I'm about to go on my first business trip away. So that'll be my first night or two nights away from Aiden. And I think that this leading up to this has been the worst mentally for me, all of postpartum so far, uh, just because there's just a lot of anxiety around leaving him this early, having to figure out how to navigate the travel by myself with pumping and bringing milk back and everything, and then worrying about and leaving all the responsibilities with you, and I feel guilty for that, um, but... I know you'll do a good job and I know that it'll all be okay, but that is probably the hardest thing that I'm having to go through so far. Yeah. This is a topic I want to plead the fifth on because I didn't want you going in the first place. So any other topics? <laughs> Nothing else for me. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. Yes. But I don't, I believe that one of the things we're working on with Erin is her standing up for herself a little bit more and standing her ground. But this time we'll let it go. But next time I, I'd, I'd really like for you to voice your opinion that you just told me. And Anything I did. else? I'm not going to the full trip. <laughs> oh, by one day, by a half day. You're flying back a half day early. Okay. I love you. That is it. If anyone ever has any postpartum questions, wants to talk to somebody who's been through it, needs advice on how to safely return to exercise, that is my passion. And I would be more than happy to help give guidance. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway I would say from watching you is there's so much information out there that you can learn from prior to going through things. And I mean, for sure, we know this in all other areas of life, but I'll give a great example. 
as soon as you got pregnant, you joined like Facebook groups. And even though like 50% of the information in there is trash, a lot of it is really good. So like, if well, like give an example of something that was good. Like stuff with the baby, like, like skin true. stuff or skin like skin stuff or like even something that I'm thinking about is like so for context, these groups that we're talking about, it's like we were due in April of 2023. So there's like a Facebook group with everyone in the world whose baby is due in April of 2023. And so you're with all these mothers that are going through pretty much the exact same things that you're going through. And something that was helpful, it almost felt more helpful once the baby was born, but there was a period of pregnancy where I was experiencing a symptom and I didn't know that I should go to the doctor for it. It was like itching and <laughs> itching around like my ankles. And who would have thought that that would be something related to pregnancy potentially that could be And of course, like I thought risk. you were crazy. I'm just like, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, and then I showed him all these things that like someone was like, I've been itching and blah, blah, blah. And people are like, you need to go to the doctor right now. And so I made an appointment and the doctor's like, you need to come in right now for these tests. And so we did that. But something that was helpful once the baby was born and things continue to be helpful, but things like, you know, how many ounces is your baby eating? when you're breastfeeding and starting to pump, like what's that schedule and when is your baby sleeping and what are you doing? Like just sleep strategies and that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it really just comes down to not just this aspect of life, pregnancy and, and birth, but in all areas of life, there's people going out, there's people out there that are going through right now what you're going through or they have gone through what you're going through. So the more that you can prepare yourself, the separation is in the preparation. That's really what I would tell anybody going through this experience, whether you're the woman or the man, especially the man, because you're playing uh, the supportive role. And I don't really know, like <laughs> prior to you getting getting pregnant, I had knew nothing about any, like nothing. So really be communicating with your wife or significant other about what's going on with them and being supportive of them and learning what's happening, because that's the best way that you can play a supportive role. This is CJ. This is Aaron. And this is the Thrive on Life podcast. The best thing that you can do for us right now is share this episode with somebody that needs to hear it. Give us that five-star rating and review, and we'll chat with you next time. Thrive on, y'all. Thrive on.